Vision 4, Soul and Body. Then I saw a most great and serene splendor, flaming, as it were, with many eyes, with four corners pointing toward the four parts of the world, which was manifest to me in the greatest mystery to show me the secret of the supernal creator, and in it appeared another splendor like the dawn, containing in itself a brightness of purple lightning. And behold, I saw on the earth people carrying milk in earthen vessels and making cheeses from it, and one part was thick, and from it strong cheeses were made, and one part was thin, and from it weak cheeses were curdled, and one part was mixed with corruption, and from it bitter cheeses were formed. And I saw the image of a woman who had a perfect human form in her womb. And behold! By the secret design of the supernal creator that form moved with vital motion, so that a fiery globe that had no human lineaments possessed the heart of that form and touched its brain and spread itself through all its members. But then this human form, in this way vivified, came forth from the woman's womb and changed its color according to the movement the globe made in that form. And I saw that many whirlwinds assailed one of these globes in a body and bowed it down to the ground, but, gaining back its strength and bravely raising itself up, it resisted them boldly and said with a groan. 1. Lament of the soul returning by God's grace from the path of error to Zion. A pilgrim, where am I, in the shadow of death, and in what path am I journeying, in the path of error? And what consolation do I have, that which pilgrims have? For I should have had a tabernacle adorned with five square gems more brilliant than the sun and stars, for the sun and stars that set would not have shone in it, but the glory of angels, the topaz would have been its foundation and all the gems its structure, its staircases made of crystal and its courtyards paved with gold. For I should have been a companion of the angels, for I am a living breath, which God placed in dry mud, thus I should have known and felt God. But alas! When my tabernacle saw that it could turn its eyes into all the ways, it turned its attention toward the north, oh, oh! And there I was captured and robbed of my sight and the joy of knowledge, and my garment all torn. And so, driven from my inheritance, I was led into a strange place without beauty or honor, and there subjected to the worst slavery. Those who had taken me struck me and made me eat with swine and, sending me into a desert place, gave me bitter herbs dipped in honey to eat. Then, placing me on the rack, they afflicted me with many tortures. And stripping me of my garments and dealing me many wounds, they sent me out to be hunted, and got the worst poisonous creatures, scorpions and asps and other vermin, to hunt and capture me, and these spewed out their poison all over me so that I was made helpless. Therefore they mocked me, saying, Where is your honor now, oh? And I trembled all over and with a great groan of woe said silently to myself, Oh, where am I, oh? From whence did I come here, and what comforter shall I seek in this captivity? How shall I break these chains? Oh, what eye can look on my wounds, and what nose can bear their noisome stench? And what hands will anoint them with oil? Oh, who will have mercy on my affliction? May heaven graciously hear my cry, and earth tremble at my grief, and every living thing incline with pity toward my captivity. For the bitterest sorrow oppresses me, who am a pilgrim without comfort and without help. Oh, who will console me, since even my mother has abandoned me when I strayed from the path of salvation? Who will help me but God? But when I remember you, O oh Mother Zion, in whom I should have dwelt, I see the bitter slavery to which I am subjected. And when I have called to memory the music of all sorts that dwells in you, I feel my wounds. And when I remember the joy and gladness of your glory, I am horrified by the poisons that pollute them. Oh, where shall I turn? And where shall I flee? My sorrows are without number, for if I continue in these evils, I shall become the companion of those whom I knew to my shame in the land of Babylon. And where are you, O oh Mother Zion? Woe is me that I so unluckily drew back from you, if I had not known you, I would sorrow more lightly. But now I will flee from these evil comrades, for wicked Babylon has put me in a leaden dish and crushed me with heavy bludgeons so that I hardly breathe. And when I pour out my tears and groans to you, O oh my mother, wicked Babylon sends forth such a noise and roar of sounding waters that you cannot hear my voice. So with great care I will seek the narrow ways by which to escape my evil comrades and my unhappy captivity. And when I had said these things, I went away by a narrow path and hid myself from sight of the north in a small cave, bitterly weeping for the loss of my mother, and also for all my sorrows and all my wounds. 
And so many tears did I shed, weeping and weeping, that my tears soaked all the pain and all the bruises of my wounds. And behold, a most sweet fragrance touched my nostrils, like a gentle breath exhaled by my mother. Oh! What groans and tears I poured forth then, when I felt the presence of that small consolation. And in my joy I uttered such cries and shed such tears that the very mountain in whose cave I had hidden myself was shaken by it. And I said, O oh mother, O oh mother Zion, what will become of me? And where is your noble daughter now? Oh, how long, how long have I been deprived of your maternal sweetness, in which with many delights you gently brought me up? And I delighted in these tears as if I saw my mother. But my enemies, hearing these cries of mine, said, Where is she, whom up to now we kept with us as we liked, so that she completely carried out our will? Look how she is calling upon the dwellers in heaven. Let us therefore use all our arts and guard her with such great zeal and care that she cannot escape us, for before she was completely subject to us. If we do this, she will follow us again. But I came secretly out of the cave in which I had hidden and tried to go up to such a height that my enemies would be unable to find me. They, however, set in my way a sea of such raging heat that I could not pass over it. There was, indeed, a bridge, but so small and narrow a one that I could not cross by it. And on the shore of that sea appeared a mountain range so high that I could not make my way across it. And I said, Oh, wretched woman that I am, what shall I do now? For a little while just now I felt the sweetness of my mother's presence, and I thought she was trying to call me to her, but oh! Is she now leaving me again? Oh! Where shall I turn? For if I return to my former captivity, my enemies will deride me more than before, because I tearfully cried out to my mother and for a little while felt her gentle sweetness, but now I am forsaken by her again. But because of that sweetness which my mother had lately sent me, I was for the first time filled with such strength that I turned to the east and resumed my way along the narrow path. But the paths were so hedged in by thorns and thistles and such obstacles that I could scarcely take a step. However, with great labor and sweat I struggled through them at last, so worn out by my travail that I could scarcely breathe. Thus, at last, I attained with the utmost fatigue to the summit of the mountain in which I had hidden before and turned downward to the valley into which I had to descend and behold. There in my way were asps, scorpions, serpents and other like crawling things, all hissing at me. Terrified I uttered the loudest of shrieks, crying, O oh mother, where are you? I would suffer less if I had not lately felt the sweetness of your presence, for I am falling again into the captivity in which I lay just now. Where now is your help? And then I heard my mother's voice, saying to me, Two on the wings of the soul. O oh daughter, run! For the most powerful giver whom no one can resist has given you wings to fly with. Therefore fly swiftly over all these obstacles. And I, comforted with great consolation, took wing and passed swiftly over all those poisonous and deadly things. Three on the tabernacle it entered. And I came to a tabernacle, whose interior was all of the strongest steel. And, going in, I did works of brightness where I had previously done works of darkness. And in that tabernacle I placed at the north a column of unpolished steel, on which I hung fans made of diverse feathers, which moved to and fro. And, finding manna, I ate it. At the east I built a bulwark of square stones and, lighting a fire within it, drank wine mixed with myrrh and unfermented grape juice. At the south I built a tower of square stones, in which I hung up red shields and placed trumpets of ivory in its windows. And in the middle of this tower I poured out honey and mixed it with other spices to make a precious unguent, from which a great fragrance poured forth to fill the whole tabernacle. But at the west I built nothing, for that side was turned toward the world. And while I was absorbed in this work, my enemies seized their quivers and attacked my tabernacle with their arrows but I was so absorbed in the work I was doing that I did not notice their madness until the gates of the tabernacle were full of arrows. But none of the arrows could penetrate the door or the steel lining of the tabernacle, so that I also could not be injured by them. When they saw this, they sent a tremendous flood of water to wash away both me and my tabernacle, but their malice accomplished nothing. Wherefore I boldly mocked them, saying, 
the architect who built this tabernacle was wiser and stronger than you. Collect your arrows and put them down, for from now on they cannot make your will triumph over me. See, what wounds have they given me? With great pain and labor I have waged many wars against you, and you tried to put me to death, but you could not, for I was protected by the strongest armor and brandished sharp swords against you and thus vigorously defended myself from you. Retreat, therefore, retreat, for you will have me no longer. For lament of the soul while resisting the devil's whirlwinds with God's help. But I, fragile and untaught, saw that many whirlwinds rushed upon another of these globes and tried to throw it down, but could not, for it resisted strongly and gave them no room to rage. It nonetheless spoke with lamentation, saying, I am a poor little thing, but I have a great duty. Oh, what am I? And what is the theme of my outcry? I am the living breath in a human being, placed in a tabernacle of marrow, veins, bones and flesh, giving it vitality and supporting its every movement. But alas! Its sensibility gives rise to filth, licentiousness and wantonness of conduct and every kind of vice. Oh! Oh, how great is the groaning of my complaint! For when the works of my tabernacle prosper, the devil's persuasion meets me and ensnares me, and uplifts me in haughty pride, so that I say, I want to act according to the joys of earthly fertility. For inside my tabernacle I understand all works, but I am so impeded by its ardent desires that before I can discern my proper work I see dire wounds in me. Oh, what a cry I let out! And I say, O oh God, did you not create me? Look how vile earth oppresses me! And I start to run away. How is this? When my tabernacle knows carnal desire, then, because I take pleasure in its carnal acts, I myself fulfill those acts. But reason, which along with knowledge lives in me, shows me that I was created by God. And by reason I remember that Adam, when he had transgressed God's command, was afraid and hid himself. So I too am afraid and hide myself from the face of God when I sense that my works in my tabernacle are contrary to God. But when I think above all of the leaden scale of sin, I condemn all those works that burn with carnal desire. 5. On the whirlwinds engendered by the devil's persuasion. Alas for me, a pilgrim! How can I survive among these dangers? And what happens when the devil's persuasion invades me, saying, is a thing good which you do not know and cannot see and cannot do, and again, why forsake what you do know and do understand and can do? What shall I do then? Full of sorrow, I will answer, oh! Miserable me! For harmful poisons were instilled into me through Adam, when he disobeyed God and was cast out into the world and joined his tabernacle to carnal things. For in the taste of the fruit he knew by disobedience, a harmful sweetness poured itself into his blood and flesh, producing the corruption of vice. And therefore I feel the sin of the flesh in me, and intoxicated by this sin, I neglect the most pure God. But I must not follow the taste my tabernacle has in it. For since Adam was pure and honest when God created him and he first appeared, I fear God, knowing that I too was created pure and honest. But now, through the evil habits of vice, I dwell in disquietude. Oh! In all these ways I am a pilgrim. Therefore the whirlwinds tell me lies in many voices, which rise up within me, saying, Who are you? And what are you doing? And what are these battles you are fighting? You are indeed unhappy, for you do not know whether your work is good or bad. Where will you go? And who will save you? And what are these errors that are driving you to madness? Are you doing what delights you? Are you escaping what distresses you? Oh! What will you do when you know this and are ignorant of that? For what delights you is not lawful for you, and what distresses you God's precept compels you to do. And how do you know whether these things are so? It would be better for you if you did not exist. And after these whirlwinds have risen up thus within me, I begin to tread another path that is hard for my flesh to bear, for I begin to practice righteousness. But then I doubt as to whether or not the Holy Spirit has given this to me, and I say, this is useless. And I wish to fly above the clouds. How? I wish to fly above my faculties and start things I cannot finish. But when I try to do these things, 
I only stir up great sadness in myself, so that I do no works, either on the heights of sanctity or on the plains of good will but I bear within me the disquietude of doubt, desperation, sadness and oppression in all things. And when the devil's persuasion disturbs me, then, oh, how great a calamity overtakes me. For I am overcome in my unhappiness by all the evils that are or can be in blame, malediction, mortification of body and soul and shameful words against the purity, healing and loftiness that are in God. And then wickedness suggests to me that all the felicity and all the good which is in man as well as God will be to me harmful and oppressive, offering me death rather than life. Oh! How unhappy is this struggle, which forces me from labor to labor, from sorrow to sorrow, from discord to discord, depriving me of all happiness. 6. From what cause these errors come into being? But from whence does the evil of these errors come into being? From this, that the ancient serpent has within himself astuteness and deceptive cunning and the deadly poison of iniquity. For by his astuteness he infuses me with stubbornness in sinning and withdraws my intellect from the fear of God, so that I am not afraid to sin, and say, Who is God? I do not know who God is. And by his deceptive cunning he instills obduracy into me, so that I am hardened in evil. And by the deadly poison of iniquity he takes spiritual joy away from me, so that I can rejoice neither in man nor in God, and thus incites me to despairing doubt, so that I do not know whether or not I can be saved. Oh! What are these tabernacles that they should suffer so much danger from the deception of the devil? But when, by God's gift, I remember that God created me, then in the midst of these oppressions I give this answer to the devils. Tempting, I will not yield to the frail clay, but furiously wage war. How? When my tabernacle tries to do works of unrighteousness, I will tread upon marrow, blood and flesh in the wisdom of patience, the way the strong lion defends itself and the serpent fleeing a mortal blow hides itself in its hole. For I must not let myself be struck by the devil's arrows or practice the pleasures of the flesh. How? 7. How anger, hatred and pride are restrained. When anger tries to burn up my tabernacle, I will look to the goodness of God, whom anger never touched and thus I will be sweeter than the air, which in its gentleness moistens the earth, and have spiritual joy because virtues are beginning to show themselves in me. And thus I will feel God's goodness. And when hatred tries to darken me, I will look to the mercy and the martyrdom of the Son of God, and so restrain my flesh, and in faithful memory receive the sweet fragrance of the roses that spring from thorns. And so I will acknowledge my Redeemer. And when pride tries to build in me a tower of vanity without foundation on the rock, and to erect in me the loftiness that wants no one to be like itself but always to be taller than the rest, oh! Who will help me then, when the ancient serpent who fell into death by wishing to be above everyone is trying to cast me down? Then I say with grief, Where is my King and my God? What good can I do without God? None. But then I, look to God who gave me life, and I run to the most blessed virgin who trod underfoot the pride of the ancient abyss, and thus I am made a strong stone of God's edifice and that rapacious wolf, who choked on the divine hook, from now on cannot, conquer me. And thus in God's sublimity I know the sweetest good, which is humility, and feel the sweetness of the unfailing balsam and rejoice in the delightfulness of God as if I were amid the fragrance of all perfumes. And thus I ward off the other vices by the impregnable shield of humility.